Plot of a b-boy strap. Fem stack cats get kidnapped. Then release a statement to the press. Let the rest know who did that. Metal fist terrorists claim responsibility. Broken household name usually set in hostility. Um, what is MF? Silly. I like to take the yeah, yeah. for two million. Streaming in. What's happening, everybody? We'll let some more people stream in. In the meantime, y'all can enjoy this Operation Doomsday by Brother MF Doom. I know y'all know about this. We got any Doom fans out there? Y'all know about mm, food? If you don't, you need to get up on this Doom. So, uh, let's see. It's 301. Is our buddy, brother Twitty here yet? R.I.P. Doom. Yes. I started, I didn't even know they had a um, MF Doom mask on this live. I started to flip it like that, but I don't know if y'all ready for that. So I'm going to hold off on that. We might do that on Doom's birthday or something. <laughs> All right, there my brother is. So, look, we're going to get started. Um, I want to just say a couple things and then we'll invite brother twitty in uh thank you all for joining my name is brian terry i'm the chef in residence at moad the museum of the african diaspora in san francisco and i create public programming around health food farming um food justice all the things that i've been working on for the past 20 years and the work continues to grow you will be if someone asks can we pre-order your new book great question um black Food, my forthcoming collection of essays, recipes, and artwork will be available for pre-order next, not next month, May. It'll be ready in May. Actually, it's ready now. You can go, yes, you can go on Amazon.com and other um, booksellers and you can pre-order, but we haven't uploaded the cover yet. And so if you go there, it's just going to be a whatever, just some blank space where the cover typically um, sits. So... We're almost done with the cover and it's gorgeous. It's, forget about food photos. Look, I'm not gonna even tell you. I was about to tee it up and, and describe it, but I'm just gonna wait. So the cover is almost done and then we will be unveiling it before May 1st. So um, I'm really excited for you all to see this um, just groundbreaking cookbook cover because that's what it is. Um, I want to invite Twitty in. We're going to have a short conversation with Twitty. It's late over on the um, East Coast where he is. I know he probably wants to just spend the weekend chilling like we all should be doing. Just because we're home all the time or for those of us who are art doesn't mean we should be working all the time. And I'm saying that to my damn self. Um, <laughs> so, um, Michael Twitty, I mean, like, do I need to give a bio for Beyonce or Oprah Winfrey or any of our titans who are among us today? I don't know. I don't think I do. I don't know if I need to give a um, bio for Twitty, but um, I'll just quickly say he is one of our um, most important writers and thinkers working today. Yeah, F. Well, I'm not going to say that, but <clears throat> I will say, I always, um, you know, have to mention the major booksellers or I'll get in trouble. But yeah, please support independent booksellers. Um, I hope that you have some in your local community that you can um, just roll over to. If not, you can check out BookSense. You can check out, um, uh, what was the other one? Indie Books, IndieBooks.org. Um, they will connect you with local booksellers so that you can... Um, order your book from them they can deliver it to you or you can discover independent booksellers in your community so um yeah michael twitty culinary historian author um teacher um polymath this brother can do it all um tv personality uh his latest book is rice which is a part of the uh, savor of the south series by the university of north carolina press and whatever t Twitty touches is gold, so you know this is fire. I'm not gonna even pretend like I was able to read it. I have a lot going on, but you best believe I'm taking this with me wherever I'm going this weekend, and I will be devouring this. So, let's bring our brother in.
Uh oh, there he is. So, I don't know what I don't know what's up with my. Hold on, let me let me introduce you all to my like shirt. <laughs> you looking a little blurry over there, my brother. <laughs> I know. I know. Since I got this new um um cover, I'm like in a little bit of a blur. Yeah, man. But I'm here. I'm here. How are you're you? Here. You're here. I'm doing well. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't first simply say big up to Kaiser, who has so generously supported this uh, program and um, underwritten this important um, work that we're doing at the museum that's related to food. Uh, Absolutely. Brother Twitty, welcome back. You So you get special. You always get A1 first class special privileges having um, actually come to the museum. We, we centered our whole program around you, which was so lovely. And, um, you know, I don't think we've spoken publicly since then. So it's great to see you again, brother. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And thank you for wishing me a chill weekend, but it's not going to be because Pesach is here. Passover is here. Ah, and, yes. And, yes. Um, I'm actually going right back to my kitchen right before Shabbat begins to turn things on so my husband can turn them off later. Because we got to get all the food done by the night. My brother, what you got on the menu? Tell us. Tell the people. Oh, no. Well, I, I hate to say this, but it, I'm going to tell you right now, it's an omnivore venue, so please don't uh, keep, keep your love for it, brother. I know you always do. Well, but just so you know, and I'm glad you mentioned that, but before you get into it, I, I, I should say this now to tee it up. Black food isn't a vegan cookbook. I really thought it was important that all the chefs that I brought into the project have the space to tell the story that speaks to their culinary tradition, their um, persona, who they are. So I, I definitely encouraged a lot of people to think about offering a plant-based option, but I didn't want to be overly prescriptive and I wanted people to bring what they felt most represented, you know, them and their people. And so there are some animal products in the book. Fantastic. Is that the book I did the little essay for? That's the book you did the little essay for, the killer oh, essay. It's a big oh. essay, my brother. They little. That's a big essay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I just, I, it's been a minute. So I just thought, okay, that's beautiful. That's great. And you said, that's right. Because you mentioned the art, the artwork was very important. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So we're doing, um, so I'll start with the plants first. Um, I'm doing um, some asparagus with a, a sweet and sour sauce, mainly mainly sour, mm. with pre lemon, preserved lemon, and peach, peaches. Ooh, okay. And um, I'm doing, um, Jay Cohen wrote a beautiful new cookbook called Jew-ish, and there's a recipe for baharat potatoes, baharat, the uh, Middle Eastern spice mm -hmm. mixture. And we're gonna mash the red potatoes and olive oil, and just did the basics. But I wanted the flavor profile to be different. Yep. I'm doing matzo meal fried chicken. I'm doing um, brisket with uh, the the saute is made with um, mushrooms and um, balsamic fig onion jam. Mm. So a lot of a lot of like sweet and sour and and whatever. And I'm doing like um, the salad's gonna be pretty basic. Um, but then again, when you eat all this matzo and all this, this carbs and all this protein, you gotta you know go heavy on that. But I'm doing some collard greens the next day that are stir fried with schmaltz and um, um, I forget what I'm shallots and things. So and, and vegetarian and vegetarian um, uh, oyster sauce. Word. Okay. You know, made from, you know, made from the mushrooms and whatnot. No doubt. So it's gonna there'll be matzo ball gumbo, which will be meatless. Matzo ball gumbo. I was about to ask about matzo ball soup, but damn, tell me about that. Can you break that down for me? So this is this is actually something that a lady named Mildred Covert was interviewed by Marcy Cohen Ferris, who wrote the book Matzo Ball Gumbo, which was based on her dissertation about the food of Southern Jews. Mm. And Mildred Covert was somebody I met many, many years ago when I was doing the Southern Discomfort Tour that became the cooking gene in New Orleans. And she grew up with all of these sort of like creolized foods um, between black and Ashkenazi Jewish foodways. And of course, the cooks were black, you know, and but they were the ones who transformed that, bridged the, t the gap of the two foodways. Yeah. And so basically you make a, instead of using flour, you use potato, you two use potato flour because mm -hmm. of Passover. And then you make wait, a roux. Wait, wait. And you, you use potato flour to make the roux? Yes. 
Oh, yes. wow. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so remember, remember way back when, when you, we were at Soul Summit, you made that gumbo there? Yep. Like the lemon gumbo. Like a lot of those same flavors are going to be in it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I also, I, for those people who don't know, I, uh, because I follow Sephardic practice, I eat kidney oat. Kidney oat le- means that um, some Jews who are from Central Eastern European background don't eat kidney oat. Kidney oat are beans, rice, peas, uh, black eyed peas, chickpeas, any of that, but also soy and corn. Um, now, a lot of people have embraced corn because the conservative movement says you can have corn. Mm-hmm. And in Israel, a lot of Ashkenazi Jews eat kidney oat, but some do not. But the reason why I need to mention this is because all of that makes a big difference in how you observe Passover. Like, right. I know families will not touch any of that. And so, therefore, Brian, like, there's a lot of families where they'll even replace, like, the mayonnaise or this or that because in America, corn syrup is used to make a lot of these things. Yep. Um, even if it doesn't, you have to have a, you know, you have to um, think about soybean oil. Mm-hmm. You can't have vegetable oil. So, for, but for us, uh, olive oil, schmaltz, Soybean oil, it's all good, mm-hmm. but you have to go. We check our rice three times on a on a on a on a black tablecloth. Mm. That's part of the, that's part of the practice. So Beautiful. it's 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 fun. It's trying, but it's also my favorite holiday because it's about liberation. We come from an enslaved people. We know this story. I think some of, some people have seen the African American Seder plate that I put out through Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've done that for several years now. But Zerflin, a uh, uh, design company out of Baltimore helped me put something together in Queen Quet from the Gullah Geechee Nation. Mm-hmm. My cousins helped me put together the four questions in Gullah. So I try to make that, in, and also this year is all about these kipot um, from Jordan Carey, who have black figures on them. There's Marsha P. Johnson. Wow. And there's Nina Simone and James Baldwin and, and Zora Neale Hurston and other heroes and sheroes mm-hmm. of, our, mm-hmm. of, of our culture. So, yeah. It's going to be a very black Jewish uh, Pesach in so, the Twitty household. Let me ask you this. How has, because I'm assuming you had to put a hold on things like Seder gatherings or just gatherings in general. And I'm wondering, like, how have you tried to maintain many of these practices in the midst of the pandemic and the inability to, to gather in the ways that we uh, were before that? So usually I would be, I would go to someone's, uh, go to like a friend's house and they have like 15, 20 people. But last year was certainly circumscribed. It was down to three. This year's going to be four. Yay, four people for the entire first Seder. Um, and I do too. So it's going to be small, but the, but I but I feel like at least having four people, um, all of my, I have not been vaccinated yet. My other folks have been vaccinated. So we'll be doing with a mask for most of the Seder. Mm-hmm. We'll be masked up. We're, we're being very, very, very super cautious, but we're, but it's also really good weather this weekend. So we're going to do a lot of it outside as well. Nice. And so it'll be, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Um, but still, uh, you know, you make all this food and I tell people, I don't get a day off even during Pesach or another holiday because, you know, I'm, I'm like frontline first level food, social media person. I'm not like these folks who get, like the million dollar camera and do the whole setup and have the light and have the crew. Mm-hmm. It's just me. And I, I assure you that the, that the pictures I take are better than this blurriness you see me with right now. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that I want people to see it's so important right now to capture these things because so many people are isolated. Yeah. And I and last year, I'll never forget when, you know, just three of us. Um, and it felt very important to have a Seder because it, it was so like uh, isolated. Yeah. And um, but one lady wrote me and she, on Twitter and she said, you know, I'm so glad you're showing pictures because I can't go to my family mm. and I feel really alone. And the, just watching other people do their thing and like pipe in and say hugs and make all kinds of stuff made her feel better. So that's that. There's that. But there's also the fact that with the matzo ball gumbo and other things that I'm making that are that are novel to a lot of people, mm-hmm. it's important to me to document that and show them so that they can so that this culture, this, you know, cultural renaissance in the space of so many negative things that we're facing, including a vote, voter suppression, yep. can be faced head on because the opposite of trauma is taking joy in your culture. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a term that I'm sure will come up a couple times in the conversation, and I'm hoping you could give us uh, your definition 
of food ways? Because I know that might be un unfamiliar to some of the people out here. Can you tell us what that means for you? Right. So food ways is a catch all term from folklore and anthropology, meaning um, how people create the world around them with food, how their culture expresses itself through food, the food of their culture, the ingredients, the culinary culture, the food traditions, the food taboos, all of that is food ways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's almost, it's almost like saying dress ways. Well, then how do you, what are your sartorial choices in your culture? What, what is your fashion like? What is your aesthetic? Mm -hmm. So the same thing applies through food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. So I want to talk about your book. I'm excited to get into that and for people to know more about um, just what you're doing in here. It's a, it's a small book, but it's packed with a lot of information. But before we go there, I just want to know what his Twitty's life looked like. You know, I saw you on the heels of um, the cooking gene being published and you were just pretty ubiquitous for a while. Yeah. You, came, you won the book of the year at the James Beard Foundation Awards. Uh, the book was critically acclaimed. I hope for you and hubby commercially successful as well. Um, <laughs> so can you tell us what, just talk, about that period of just being swept up in all the excitement about Twitty and the, and the work that you, and you know, obviously the story had been building, but that was like, kind of like the, yeah, um, yeah. the penultimate moment of that period. Can you just talk about that period? Sure. Cause you know what? I think um, I had a couple of moments of just like life is finally changing. Hmm. I read, there was an article and I, it was one of the uh, folks who was in very smart brothers. Mm -hmm. And it was an article about what it's like to finally have two dimes to rub together. Mm. And the fact that you still feel like this, 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 my dog's in here now, this vulture of just like the shoe dropping around you. And you don't, you don't really believe that some of the things that you're doing are real. Yeah. And, I, you know, for some people, it's, it's self-doubt and imposter syndrome. For me, it's not imposter syndrome because I've always been this bitch. You know, I've always, you know, I've always been her. Mm -hmm. So I know, I know who she is. I, I've always been this queen. And, and like, so I, that's, that's not the problem. That was never the issue. The issue was, are people really taking me seriously? Are they really liking me? Are they really okay with me? Do I have permission to do what I've always wanted and loved to do? Mm -hmm. And so the past year has taught me a lot about gratitude, great, being grateful for having the chance to do this work. Yes. Being, being grateful to be able to, to like talk to you every now and then. And um, so many Nicole and Christina and BJ and Matthew Rayford as normal people. Yep. Every normal people who really have the same sort of like um, maybe not always the same trajectories, but the same kind of like stuff and political issues with, with publishing and with media and with getting, you know, getting your brand out there. That's yeah. comforting. But um, I remember that I remember then I got to tell everybody about the night that we actually did the thing at, um, at, at, at MoFAD. And I remember walking into that damn room. MoFAD, that MoFAD, room. that's our cousin. Don't get us mixed up though. MoFAD, not no, MoFAD. Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. And I remember walking in that room and with the with the whole setup, and guys, they had they had the lights on, and there was hundreds of people, and I and I just I never felt more welcome mm. than that event. I mean, I had I had African American poet, lesbian rabbi, <laughs> um, African a, African American Orisha priestess. I had all the different <laughs> elements, and I had Brian and Terry, and I'm just like y'all were like. African American gay poet. So every everybody, every black food, <laughs> queerness, uh, African spirituality and knowledge and culture, Jewish culture, mm -hmm. Jewish queerness, all of it was there. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time, I said, Well, I remember somebody saying, Well, what does that got to do with it? I'm like, Do you understand that the Bay Area got love for me? And I got love for the Bay Area. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm town spice knows when I come to town, this is gonna be a payday. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, but you know, uh, my good, my my also my 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 uh, Ileana and mm -hmm. my good friend Jasmine. I have so many family and friends there now. Chef Wanda Blake. I mean, you. I got. Uh, yeah. I'm the one box. What you took me to for the first time, 
And you were like, you need to know these people. <laughs> and I was like, we by there, and sure enough, that uh, same time, I was an omnivore. And I, I'll never forget the feeling, Brian, of walking in that space, getting there by Uber. And I'm wondering, who the hell are these people here for? Because <laughs> there was no room. There was no room. They were out on the street. And, they, and guess what? They stayed. Not one person left. Mm. They put their ears to that window, heard everywhere, have heard every word I said without a microphone, mm. and it, it was a beautiful experience. So that that was that whole trip, that whole that whole um, evening was for me an an entrance into accepting myself. Mm. That's beautiful. Saying yes, you got something to say and you got something to do. Now do it. Hell yeah! Wow. Right. Um, you said something about. I forget exactly what you said, but I do want to ask you because I and many of our colleagues have felt a certain level of freedom that we haven't in the past to truly be ourselves. You know how mm -hmm. we have all, many of us have always had to code switch and, you know, tiptoe around and navigate. But after the uprisings last year and with many of the, the corporations that we typically work with um, being called out for some of their white supremacist practices and people are embarrassed and they're recognizing that they need to fix stuff and so because of the overcorrections a lot of us black food creatives are getting energy now we're getting book deals we're getting to call shots that we haven't in the past and i'm just wondering if for you personally you felt a little more autonomy and disability to move in kind of like a more authentic way because you don't have to play the game as much because of the way that everything went down last year I don't know. I don't know. I feel like it was a catch-22 for me. Mm. Um, on one hand, I had to tell the kids, K-I-D-Z, about how, how ish really works, I hear. Because there was, remember, I, I forget the sister's name, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but I forget her name, but she um, had issues with Bon Appetit. And I remember at the same point in time, me, Omar Tate, um, Kurt Evans, and Ben Bynum had the article for Juneteenth. And a lot of people were like, oh, what, what the hell? They just did that to make us. I'm like, no, no, sweetie. These articles take a year to, to, a year to make. Mm -hmm. They don't just happen because somebody pops them up. Those pictures are not from last week. Yeah. Those pictures are from a year ago. Yeah. And this article has been, been in editing form for a year. Mm -hmm. So that's that. But then I was also like, hey, folks, it's not just about storming the castle and getting representation at mainstream spaces. It's also about creating and maintaining spaces that we make as Black creators in Black spaces and yes. keeping those businesses alive mm -hmm. and keeping those businesses fluid and making, making the mainstream want to know how, why are we so successful, what are we doing, and hands off. Like, mm -hmm. yes, we can, do, we can do both. Yeah, We can do both. We can purify our role at mainstream institutions, but also people were, people were really nasty on social media about it. And I told them, I said, wait a minute, y'all. You had a black, you had black food stylist, three black chefs, a black photographer, a black writer. All you didn't have was the black editor. Mm -hmm. But everything else was black autonomy. Mm -hmm. and, 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 that's, and, that's, and that's what I want people to respect. But at the same point in time, you know, make cuisine noir s sparkle. Go go to black newspapers and black periodicals and say you need a food you need food writers mm -hmm. you need black sommeliers you need black folks in hospitality and in cocktails and and in nutrition we need black and people who do you know work with health and exercise we need all these folks who look like us to represent in, in the whole array not to mention farming horticulture um, fisheries etc we need the entire food system to have representation we need to make sure that when we make food food and drink spaces that we support them. So that was the big takeaway I got. However, I will say this. Yeah. Last summer, it was I felt a we I felt kind of weird about it to be honest with you, Brian. I was like, all right, so y'all be so y'all are interested in black people again now cuz we dying. Mhm. Mm okay. <laughs> so that what about the whole what how about the whole 8 years when we were you know, 8 years we were in power, right? That's what he said. That's what mm -hmm. he called the book. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so the, that, so that, that, that. But, you know, there's one more thing that's important to me to say, and this is it. I am still dedicated to giving us our 400th birthday party as black folks in America. Hmm. Because that was, that was robbed and taken from us. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I think that that was definitely on purpose. We are not, we're, we're going to be about 1776, not 1619. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, you all want to do that? Cool. I'll make a dinner for 1775 and 1776 where um, Lord Dunmore issued a proclamation saying, if you are black and you will take up arms, we will give you your freedom. Mm -hmm. Tell me. Tell me about all them folks who ran away from Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, and South Carolina joined the British Army to get away. And by yeah. the way, the, the, some of the highest paid people in the in the uh, Red Coat Army, you know who they were? Black musicians. Really? Yep. I had no idea. They, they paid us to make the soundtrack of the counter-revolution. <laughs> so, I mean, go on about it. But, you know, at the same point in time, I think that I am... I'm still proud to be an African American because I think we keep this country honest. When it says it's going to say do something and say something, yeah. We're the ones who do it, especially our sisters, especially our mothers, especially our women. Yep. I um I think we should anticipate another protest summer. Um oh, obviously oh, uh, start now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look, look, Brian, you and me going to be down in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Feeding people mm -hmm. in line. We yeah. chefs are going. Chefs and food provider hospitality, hospitality folks are going to because they have aimed their 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 voter suppression yeah. at a community that suffers from hypertension, diabetes, etc. Where you need water, where you need a little bit of food every now and then to keep you up. This this is a this is now we're on the biological warfare level. Oh yeah. So. We gonna be down with Jose Andres. We we better hook up with Jose because you know they gonna they gonna mess with Jose. So if we long we stay close to him. Yeah, I'm we'll down. Be... <laughs> then he could be the, uh, the the shield. <laughs> He's gonna be our abolitionist. <laughs> Yo, I'm down. Um, I'm down for whatever we need to do. And I totally agree with you in terms of, you know, one once I'm so when I first started publishing penguin was my first publisher of grub and i remember my dad sat me down he was really excited but he also was very adamant and i loved the way he phrased it and he, he expounded upon it but he was like look you got your book deal you're in the publishing now i'm happy for you but i want you to keep one your eye on one thing as you continue this trajectory master p and he went on to explain you know master i mean i knew what he's talking about but looking at Master P and how he just had that underground hustle. He created his independent businesses and he really was adamant about having his work be outside the system until it got so compelling that the system went calling for him. What do you need? How much money do you need so we can just be a part of your shine? And so mm -hmm. I'm really encouraging us all as, as I embark on a lot of these efforts to diversify food media, which I could talk about more in um, May when we make the big announcement of thinking about parallel institutions. You know, it, while we're at these publishing houses, are we taking notes? Are we thinking about how we can then create our own little independent publishing businesses? Because yeah. my thing is, look, even if you're at a major publisher, why not put out an ebook? Why not put a little 10 book recipe out that you sell for 10 bucks a pop and you could just have that passive income? And then obviously passing this along, ensuring that the younger generation, these, you know, we had to fight for this shit. We had to figure it out. We didn't have people there to tell us how much do you get paid for these brand partnerships? How much should I expect for an advance on a book deal? Like, how do I get an agent? Like all these things that we had to just kind of figure out. I feel like it's important for us to make sure that we systematically pass it down to these young folks. So, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And make sure that, and make sure that that business literacy accompanies that creative fire. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Got Critical. Yep. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want the keys to, 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 to quote, um, uh, Rabbi Jackie Mason. I don't, we don't want the keys to the executive bathroom. We want the keys to the executive office. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no doubt. No mm -hmm. doubt, my brother. Look, I am so excited about getting this book. And I know you've been doing a lot of um, important just kind of community building with folks down in um, the Carolinas, with BJ. Y'all mm -hmm. been traveling to the continent. I'd love to hear about that, the influence that it has on the book. But just kind of nuts and bolts, because I'm always trying to help people understand the inner logic and workings of the publishing industry. I'm right. wondering what made you decide to go with the university press and just do this like really like tight focus book as opposed to doing the bigger yeah. book at more at, at a trade press 
Okay, so here's the thing. Um, and this is a conversation I've been having with my agent a lot recently about, about, you know, living and life, living and legacy. You know, there is a reason why I'm at Harper Collins. There's a reason why Cooking Gene and that Coach of Soul next year will be with Harper Collins. We 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 put pause on it because it would have faded into the darkness in 2020. So whatever, it's 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 cool. It's cool. It's gonna be even better now that we have these gotten through all these flashpoints. Yeah. But I guess what I need to say about Rice is that it's part of the Savor the South series. Yeah. From UNP Press. And it's um it, it there are only two black authors, me and Bridget Lacey. Hmm. And for Rice, I met um Elaine Mazer many years ago. And she's like, Okay, yeah, all right. You yeah, you're interesting. And then when it came when the the series is is finished with Rice. So she was like, well, now that you've done all this work, I really want you to write this book. So it took a while because it was off, on, off, on. Then finally it's on. And by the time I actually got around to, to polishing it off and getting it done, I had been to Sierra Leone. I had been to Senegal. I had been to Gambia. I had been to Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, um, Togo, Benin. And so I was able to see rice in many of its uh, West African permutations as well as having gone up and down the low country from Jackson, Jacksonville and, and Wilmington, North Carolina, down to Jacksonville, Florida, through Savannah and Charleston mm -hmm. and the outlying area. So I came to it honestly, but also there were two things that were very important to me. Number one, that we talked about rice in the context of it being a key ingredient of the African Atlantic. That we talked about it as the, the byproduct of the knowledge of African women. Mm -hmm. That we talked about it being an ingredient that connected us globally to other communities, mm -hmm. as well as talking about the global South mm -hmm. in the in the American South, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to I didn't want to do just country cooking comfort food. I wanted to show people that rice is in the Kurdish community in Nashville. Rice is in the VA Cajun foodways of New Orleans and Houston. Mm -hmm. Rice is in the Afro Cuban foodways of Miami and Hialeah. Mm -hmm. Rice is in um, the Sicilian foodways of Arancini, so rice is in the Sephardic Jewish foodways of Montgomery, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia. And rice is is and always will be red rice, jambalaya, etouffee, um, dirty rice, all those things that were brought across the ocean um, with our ancestors, as well as rice and red, red beans and rice, Haitian and red beans and rice, New Orleans, as well as peas and rice, wet Caribbean, and, 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 Hoppin' John and um, a Jambala Congri in America. So mm -hmm. this kind of like acknowledging that all rice people around the world have that same feeling, that same saying, if I haven't mm -hmm. eaten rice, I feel like I haven't eaten, you know? So there's that, there's all those different levels. And I wanted to speak to them, even though it's a, it's a very focused tome, you know, I didn't feel like there was a need to write like a billion words, you know, how you, you have these like these Bibles that they, they try to make for like the definitely made for like the award circuit. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. the, the flavor and Bible, to, the whatever Bible. Yeah, these comprehensive every books. little detail, every yeah. little detail, mm -hmm. and every bit, bit of rice species and what if and maybe. I'm I'm really not I'm really not that um, attentive or focused to do that. <laughs> I'm just hungry, and that's, <laughs> that's the difference between those two things. I can't do it. By the way, I have vegetable. I've had vegetable king for quite some time. So next time I see you, I'm getting my autograph. Thank you very much. Please. Oh, mm -hmm. come on, man. You got that. Um, what do you think? Love it. Love it. And, it's, I, you know, I guess sometimes when I do, like, green stuff and vegetable stuff and, like, like plant-based stuff, people say, are you turning it? And I know. I just, I just understand that, you know, as I get older, it's, it's far more important for me to eat those things that um, – give me the, all the nutrients I need, all the, I mean, I've been doing that. I mean, I grew up eating, you know, 90% fresh vegetables. We didn't have a lot of frozen stuff. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of canned stuff. We had maybe had tomatoes, sometimes corn. If my grandmother wanted to make like, uh, you know, some, you know, corn pudding or something like that. Yeah. But mostly it was almost always fresh corn, almost always seasonal stuff. And just, a, just a very few canned vegetables, but a lot of, a lot of, I ate my veggies growing up as a kid and I, yeah. and I still do. But I think right now it's about being grown up and expanding the repertoire. Right. I mean, if anybody, I mean, I'm not here. I'm not here to um to be uh to 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 put you in the, under the pumpkin fan and fan you too much. 
but I'll be real about it. It's nice having um, black authors like yourself. What's it, what's her name? Sweet Potato Souffle. Mm-hmm. Um, Tap Sauce. Yeah. Yeah, Sweet Potato Souffle. Ah, that was nice. Sweet <laughs> Potato Souffle. And then Tabitha, who's blown up. Yeah. You know, nice. showing us how to make how to make vegetables speak our language as, Af- as Africans in the Americas. Yeah. That's it. So it's very, it's very good. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I don't even know if it's that much to say. I, I know you got a lot going on and I don't want to hold you up too much. I just, I want to make sure you're doing well. Um, I know that this period has been physically, um, mentally, emotionally taxing mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Um, yes. How, how are you just holding up in general? Like, have you been doing, I'm assuming you've been getting um, a lot of virtual events coming your way. So I'm assuming you've been yeah, busy doing yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It, we, it's weird because at first I was like, well, I don't have to travel anywhere. I don't have to do anything. But, but then again, when you're worried about what's going to happen to you, that's nice. But now that we're, we may, we may, if everybody does their part, turn the corner. Um... I forgot that doing these programs can be energy vampires. They can take stuff out of you. And you're you're like, well, wait a minute. All I did was sit in my home. Yeah, you did. But you also scrambled to get the area cleaned up. You also took a little shower. You also took the dog out. You also silenced your phone. You also uh, had to worry about the, the delivery people for X, Y, and Z showing up. You know, you know, making sure you're on the the time, your schedule yeah. is and stuff like that. You don't have multiple things happening. If I had children, children want them through here, da 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 da. You know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's well, still welcome it's to my life. <laughs> oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. How old are them gals now? Seven and ten. That's what I thought. I said eight and ten earlier, but seven and ten, yes. Yeah. So when I when I met them briefly, they were little little ones, little little ones. They grow. So I said, down. oh. They acting like it too. But I feel you know, man, like I think about these events and you know, there's an invisible labor that I think I often just don't, I take for granted. But when I have to do these events, I'm like, oh yeah, like I need to do all the shopping. I gotta do the prep by myself. I gotta rearrange the room. I need to do the lighting and the sound. And so it's just, right. it's a lot of labor that goes in these events. And I'm just like Zoom fatigued at this point. like. Oh I'm, yes! Oh I'm yes! IG live fatigued. I'm just like <laughs> done with <laughs> screens. <laughs> right, right. I think, and it, and it's going to be interesting going back to some level of that. I've had like one in person event, and it was very small. And I still it, there are some parts of it that were just like, all right, I guess this this is how you do it. I guess I have to walk through the, the walk through the paces. Mm-hmm. And there were other parts that felt foreign. It was weird. But, you know, I, I think it'll really feel weird once, um, well, some organizations will continue to do Zoom stuff. Others, they really do want you in person because as a food professional, they also probably want you to, like, do demonstrations and make stuff. And that's that requires, that's not just, hey, here I am through a screen. It's yeah. not the same experience. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of energy. And I keep forgetting, like, sometimes... I'll be ambitious and I'll be like, I'm going to do this and this, this until I've learned now. I will get all my stuff done before the two or three Zooms I have that day. And after they're done, it's time to chill. It's yeah. time to eat, chill, take a walk, walk the dog, exercise, whatever you're going to do, mm-hmm. and go to bed. What of your, do you have self care practices that you've Im- implemented to help you just be sane and well? Yeah, like I don't have I don't know how many of these I have now. I think I have one from every tradition. So I have all my little um mitbacha and and you know prayer beads which help me meditate cuz I'm not a still person. Mm. And a lot of get, get first of all get still and I'm like I can't do that. Mm-hmm. I got to keep moving. I I I I'm I am not kidding when I talk about um adult ADHD. I'm not making a joke. I'm yeah. like, this is part of my creative energy is also part of the part of me that has problems with executive functioning and order and spatial visual stuff. And just, but at the same point in time, it's also the fire behind the other things I do, mm. you know, the enthusiasm, the energy, the, 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 um, obsessive focus. Yeah. And so, um, going between that, 
Um, we've been, the husband and I have been walking when the weather has been nice. It's been kind of difficult with the, with, you know, winter, winter wasn't bad here, but you know, it, sometimes it's clammy and gross here. Mm. Mar Maryland winter is wet. Maryland winter is not snowy. It's just wet and muddy and gray and ugly. You know, my sister's up in Laurel, Maryland. Oh, she's right around the corner. Yeah. My sister lives in Laurel. She's a physician. And so she practices in Baltimore, but yeah, she's close to you. She literally lives 15 minutes away from here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's cool. Um, it's a lot of Don't worry about this. Anyway, uh, trying to let these helicopters and planes go by. I'm outdoors, if you can't tell. Um, right. Just give me one second. It's literally a helicopter, an airplane, and somebody who's renovating their house two doors down. So. <laughs> But that what I was going to say is, you know, I feel like a lot of people in the West, we have these, we imagine meditation is always being on the mat. And, um, you right. know, we, my, my family, we practice, um, we're Zen Buddhists, but we practice in the tradition of um, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. And one of the things that I appreciate about his approach to meditation is inviting us to see every opportunity of our lives to be meditative. And so it's not just about the moment uh, you yes. carve out 20 minutes, put your timer on, ring your bell, and then sit until it's done. Right. But when you're washing dishes, how can you be totally present with that moment? When you're eating, instead of like running through the list of oh, things you need to do next day or whatever regrets, just focus on the pure pleasure of enjoying that meal. And when you do, that's what helps put you in touch with the fact that that potato you're eating is not just a potato, but it's the sun, it's the, the rain, it's the yeah. all the elements, yeah. as he would say, the cosmos in a potato or a carrot. And so I've been really mm -hmm. focusing on like, how can that active meditation be included in my everyday? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's like, you know, my husband, He's a special education teacher and interpreter for the deaf and hard of hearing. Mm. And he likes to do mise en place with me because he says, I said, that's your Zen practice, he says, and I kind of silly. And he says, oh, yeah, mm. I like mm -hmm. it's very, very focused. And he does he does a better job of cutting than I do because he's so laser focused, but he's also very slow and meditative about it. So I listen. I'm, I'm not throwing him shade. But I know if, if I have something that, that needs to be done quicker, I'm like, you know, we're going to put out the little chopper. <laughs> but if that's like it's a, we're cooking all day together or something, like we're going to buy you for Passover, mm -hmm. you know, then uh, he paints the perfect cubes and he's very, you know, his, his cutting, his knife skills are fantastic with somebody who's not a food person. Um but on the other hand of it, I just think that it's it's also um, um, people ask me, are you cooking? Are you are you doing the food stuff? You know, because everybody was doing their sourdough, right? Yeah. I wasn't. I was too worried about dying because of my people. Mm -hmm. Both phys both the physical health thing and and illness, God forbid, but also just being out in these streets. And so I didn't have the stomach for it. I was really. I mean, I I don't know. I didn't know how to react to it. Yeah, I didn't know what to do. But on the other hand, once things started to let up, I started to feel this like renaissance feeling. Like, okay, so we're going to be kind of like semi cloistered a little bit longer. So now it's time to get everything together. Mm -hmm. And so now, but now I've just like been cooking my behind. I made, I, I made a joke the other day. I go, some folks didn't get it, but but the majority of folks got it. I said, I, I was, my, my husband and I made risotto for the first time. And I said, oh, look, we made risotto together. We're officially gay married. <laughs> <laughs> you would not bury it. You get that real, you get that real quick. It's the kids don't know, though. Some of the kids don't know. They're not called the Pauls enough <laughs> for, the, for, these, for these stories. But, um, but it's been interesting. I've, I've been, we've, I've, I had to start watching Netflix and uh, all, the, all the little streaming services. Because I was like, okay, I'm kind of bored watching Law and Order and yeah, MSNBC yeah. all the damn time. Yeah. So I started watching Midnight Diner with the Japanese chef and the whole, the, oh, you know, yeah, creative. Yeah, yeah. And so I was, I saw every time he makes something good, I got to make it. You know, so I made some the the, the beef and potato stew. Nice. nice. Nikojaku, I think. It was Wait, called. hold yeah. up. 
Speaking of Netflix, Waffles and Mochi. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. Although everybody's like, did you meet Michelle? No, I did not, unfortunately. <laughs> no, no, no. How was um, that experience, though? Was that a cool experience? Oh, with you? It was a cool experience, even if it wasn't like, you know, my moment with the Obamas or something. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the puppeteers were amazing. Mm. And I have a lot of newfound respect for them and their work. Um, they were all very fun, professional people. And it was just like, I had to sit down with, with um, one of the puppets, well, puppeteers, and Jillian, I think it was, and she like coached me through what it's like to actually converse with a puppet mm. as if it's a person. And so I'm sitting there talking to her and waffles. And then about five minutes in, I'm questioning my 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 mental state because I'm like talking to waffles as if waffles is waffles. <laughs> and then so by the time I went into the, the the do the thing, I'm not I'm forgetting they're down beneath the table. Mm. And there's one moment where where uh she has waffles chewing and it was really, really hey Therese Nelson and and hey uh, S uh, Sally Hammonds University, I see y'all. Um <laughs> But like, but like, there's a moment where she's chewing, where Waffles is chewing, and it flipped me out because she can't see anything she's doing, mm. but she made Waffles look like Waffles was actually eating the rice and wow. chewing the rice, and, and it was just like, okay, where am I? But I'm, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the be the, the biggest shout out, Mashama <laughs> Bailey. Mashama Bailey handled hers. Mashama and the the puppets, it was so deep. Because Mashama was like, it's like she's talking to somebody's little kids. Oh, hey, come on, kitchen. Da, da, da. And I'm like, no, did you, were you on Sesame Street? And I didn't know what the <laughs> program was. You got skills, paid bills. I mean, it was, it was, it was fun. It was fun. That's cool. Um, but, you know, Brian, that's what it is. It's, I think people, that's why I always tell people this is not one permutation for any of us. This is us doing all the different parts in ways that other people don't because they have their thing, we have ours. And our thing is the mission of spreading the message of the intellect, meaning, and love behind black food. Yep. Bingo. And, you know, I often have people ask me how they can be of service to the movement. And I think a lot of people get stuck on this idea that, you know, grassroots activism is like the way to make change. And I remind people that it's important, it's, it's vitally important for our liberation, the grassroots on the ground movement, but everybody's not gonna be able to be out in the streets like that. And frankly, it's the young people who need to be out there because it's always their bravery, their brilliance, their fearlessness from South Africa to the American civil rights movement, the young people were the ones that were pushing it. And everybody needs to get in where they fit in. And I just use the metaphor of like, you know, drops in a bucket, they may seem insignificant until you start to see that overflow. So whether you are, designer or a poli local politician or a chef or um, a musician or a cinematographer, there's ways that we can always think about using our craft to contribute to, um, you know, this work, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, um, there's the same thing I have about black spirituality. People be like, but I thought you were, I said, you know, when you go to Africa, you see people, everybody is, um, Christian, I call it Christian Islamic, <laughs> and it's like my grandmother. My my grandmother have all these different elements in her in her life, spiritual life, just regular life. I, I don't even think there's a distinction. Mm -hmm. And practice, I mean, the, like I still have the vial of mustard seed. You, know, you, you have faith like a mustard, seed, the size of a mustard seed, mm -hmm. and it pictures of the Pope and um, stuff they brought back from Africa and. Muslim stuff and this and this and this. And it came down to my grandmother saying, um, I said, I'm a Christian lady, but but I got all these keys and one of them gonna get me into heaven. <laughs> and it's the same thing. And one of them, it's like it's like the same thing with what we do, right? We have all these keys in our work. And one of them is gonna open the door to somebody, open the door in somebody's brain to a bit, a, you know, a bigger and wider world of wide expansiveness. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of Torah before we conclude, and that it goes like this. You know, when people talk about the Exodus from Egypt, 
what they forget is that in Hebrew, the word for Egypt is um, Mizraim, Mizraim, Mizraim. And Mizraim literally means the narrow place. Because remember, geographically, the 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 in the empire the kingdom the empires and kingdoms that were Egypt clung to the Nile River, right? And so the idea is that anybody who was in this uh, what they call in Hebrew an Erev Rav a mixed multitude of enslaved people, because all empires back then rested on the labor of the enslaved and the peasant and the indentured and the impoverished, is that the the spiritual liberation inside of you in this time of spring, time of renewal and rebirth. It's supposed to be about going from that place of narrowness, mm. constriction, into a place of wide expansiveness. Tell it, tell it. That's what that's what the real exodus is. The real exodus is in your brain mm -hmm. and in your body and in your in your and your spirit. Yep. And your soul. And so that's what when we talk about celebrating the Passover, there's all these culinary elements, right? The the, the Seder the Seder plate. The the feast, uh, the shohan aruch, the 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 set table mm -hmm. in front of us. But the real exodus and real um, letziat mitzrayim exodus from Egypt is going from those narrow places, you know. Yes. And also, you know, one ritual we do it. My any time I lead a seder, which hasn't been that often, but when I do it, is I talk about what are the what are your plagues? What are the plagues we have in the world today? Mm -hmm. What are the things that we need to what are the things that we need to fight back against the minute we leave this Seder table yes. and go back to the real world? Yeah. So, you know, um, all of that's all of that's in this small little space called our lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I love if that, that's really, you know, it, it, I've been reading a lot of Vandana Shiva lately, and I just yes. last night read this essay called Monocultures of the Mind. And I feel like there's some parallels with this idea of like moving from this narrow place and expanding because, you know, she argues that um, our current global economic system pretty much is creating a world that is uniform and one dimensional, what she calls a monoculture. But what she argues is that we need to work on the monocultures of our mind and expand beyond them and understand that, you know, this expansion, diversity, you know, uh, moving to a place from where we get like everything and not just what's prescribed for us by, you know, the multinational food corporations, that's a com incumbent upon all of us. And, you know, it starts in the mind and moves around there. So I'm just, well, the, the you know, well, I, mean, I, had the, I had the privilege of meeting her at, um, at, um, uh, mad. Oh, like, we. That's funny because I said I we remember. Next to party, and it was weird because I was just like, I'm sitting next to Vidana Shiva. <laughs> um, you know, and she corrected my Hindi, which is very funny. She was like, uh-uh, look, you gonna learn this today. And I'm like, oh, you just like a sister. <laughs> uh -oh. But um, but no, you know, I've been saying to people recently that when we talk, the 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 we're on we're on culture war number four right now. And part of culture war number four is this, we're going to kill and bury the idea that we are a multicultural society. Mm. And I'm so sorry, but we are blessed to be not only con happily contaminated with each other's cultures mm -hmm. and worldviews and existences, mm -hmm. but we're also, well, we're also bound to be responsible to one another. Ooh. We have an obligation in a multicultural society to make sure our children are culturally literate Mm -hmm. They know their own background and they know other people's backgrounds. Mm -hmm. They can speak more than one language. I know that you've invested with that with your own family and children, mm -hmm. that they know how to read a map, that they know that when they, when they, they listen to the news at least once a day yep. to understand and, and, can, and can point out people and understand why we have certain conflicts. I mean, remember what happened after 9-11? Most Americans couldn't identify where Iraq was or where Afghanistan was or where Saudi Arabia was. Yeah. Um, didn't know, didn't know what Islam was. Didn't know um, why, how there were different types of Islam. How there were different types of politics. There wasn't just there were all these stereotypes and bubbles and boxes and no real understanding. Yeah. And you know, in our recent, if I may be so be so uh, tangential, our recent our recent tragedies, they're not isolated. They're not one thing. They're not just about guns, which they are. And, you know, that's the whole, you don't even get me started. 
I'm with you. But like it's also about racism. It's 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 one 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 fella, you know, he has that that colonial settler mentality, not just about people coming towards women, mm -hmm. and the other one was was faced prejudice mm -hmm. and had mental health challenges that weren't addressed by by the, the state and people and even with it from the family to the state. Yeah. And then you add in the, the add in violence. I mean, we have to we have to understand that being in a multicultural is not just race or ethnicity. It's also the culture of ability. Mm -hmm. People who, who, can, who can't see or can't hear, God forbid, are uh, people who have, you know, people who are not ambulatory. That's like, there's a whole culture there. Yeah. The culture of womanhood, the culture of manhood, the, the cultures of religion or not having one, yeah. having a theistic practice. And we don't understand each other. We and don't. yet we have the audacity to live in a country of 300 plus million people without any sense of responsibility towards the outlier, the border crosser, the forgotten and the downtrodden. Yeah. But I think you, you probably understand this, and I hope most people understand that this is being engineered. This is intentional. In the same way Absolutely. that they're engineering voter suppression, you think about a state like Texas that produces most of the textbooks that American children in public schools look at, and they mm -hmm. are intentionally obscuring facts, wiping out histories, renaming things you know you can't even say capitalism they say it's free market you can't economy the slave trade yeah exactly imagine, imagine not being able to say the word holocaust so you know yeah we're like this is this isn't a 21st century education it ain't a 20th century education like we need to and this is why i always talk about how we have to um think about moving beyond just personal um, shifts and they're important, but this is where we need to flex our political power and understand that like these structural barriers from people like truly understanding where we are, who we are, and what's going on, they're just going to exacerbate all the tensions that we've been saying. You, euphemism is the enemy of accountability. Yes, 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 yes my yeah. sister. Yeah, from Charlotte, from Charlottesville, Virginia. She knows what you're talking about. Yes, yes, brother Twitty. We're gonna wrap up. Two minutes. Can you just tell us what do you have next? And then how can people find you if they want to um, follow your work and further just be up on that? So I'm actually uh, still at Kosher Soul on Twitter and The Cooking Gene on Instagram and Michael W. Twitty on Facebook. Um, yes, uh, Sh Sean, to enter everybody else, Hag Sameach, Shabbat Shalom. Hag Pesach Sameach. I know Holy is coming. I know Easter is coming. I know there's an Islamic holiday coming, so everybody, every and every every background and not background, happy Festivus, <laughs> all of it. Um, you know, happy all Festivus up in here. <laughs> but um, but the last thing I want to say is, is that we have to we have to start doing the things that we want the state to invest in. We have to still be advocates mm -hmm. for for better practices and and absolutely shift changing practices paying people real money giving men and women equal pay mm -hmm. um making sure that 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 you may be undocumented but you are still given the rights of a human being yep. um being black and be able to vote being a black woman and being safe in these streets all the things I being an asian it. woman being, being asian pacific islander people and I being safe it. in these streets and being That's respectful right. of the fact that you built America just like just like other folks built America, built those damn railroads mm -hmm. at, at great at great thing and fighting anti Semitism yep. and fighting homophobia and transphobia. We have to do all that work. Yes. But here's the here's the here's it all in one line, Brian. Everything that happens to us occurs for the sake of someone else. And everything that happens to others occurs for our sake. And we have to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, yes. Somebody wants to say hi. You remember my brother Twitty? You met him a while ago. Hi. Say hi. Oh, look at you, beautiful. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. I'm so impressed. Look at you. <laughs> smile for me. I need to see your smile. There you go. There you go. That's a gift from God. Brother we'll Twitty. Down. We love you. We're so grateful for you taking time just to build with us. Um, thank you. Thank you. No, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you on you on Daddy Tom, bro. Yeah. So I am, you better I am. 
Um, once again, big up to Kaiser, big up to my um, sister Therese Nelson out there, always our guardian angel, just hovering above. Mm -hmm. Um, we love you, Therese. And check out the um, Therese has recently rebooted the Black Culinary website. Please peep that out. Always brilliance and yeah. this coming from her. Um, thank you all for joining us. Tell friends, you know, that we get a lot of um, action on um. YouTube once these are that's where we archive them and so um you know send it out to friends and Michael we look forward to talking to you the next time we talk to you brother absolutely once I get my little jab I'm coming to the Bay Area so look be ready come through we, we're waiting for you all right all right peace Take care, yep. bye bye